Let's go mood lighting. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Turn the side light on, and then yeah, I think one of them. I think this guy goes on. Maybe this guy goes on, or this guy goes on. This guy goes on. No, this guy goes on. Yeah, that's good. Is that? It's kind of mood lighting. All right. So um, I'm going to probably be interrupted, but by Bosey shortly, and or Andy Inglis, and that's fine. I have a. 10 minute version, a 30 minute version, a one hour version, two hour version, six hour version, an 18 hour version. Any of you uh, anesthesiologists who get to work with me or the uh, picky fellows, I will talk to you until the, uh, I am blue in the face about this stuff because um, CRM or human factors is where it is all at. Just out of interest, who ha who's heard the term CRM before? I know Charlie has because I've talked to Charlie a lot um, and Stephen has. And what context did you hear CRM in? Yeah, so it's, it's been hijacked by the medics and called crisis resource management. Its the original term was crew resource management, or how you deploy people. Um, okay, um, who's had a course at undergraduate or postgraduate level in human factors? Okay, and who's had a course in undergraduate or postgraduate on non-technical skills training? Okay, so that's very typical of most audiences I speak to about this. Um, uh, these are my aims. Um, just to help you understand what CRM is and understand there's actually domains and spaces within CRM um, to convince at least some of you that something of what I'm going to say this morning or this afternoon or what we're training in the simulator has any relevance to um, improving teamwork and patient safety. And then the last thing is to, to inspire some of you some of the tools which I'll introduce this morning and we'll practice in the simulator this afternoon. And you can incorporate them to your clinical practice uh, tonight or tomorrow. I mean, you can use them straight away. Um, so CRM is the umbrella term, human factors is another term which describes it's the same thing. Non-technical skills training is a, is a term that crept into the medical literature. So technical skills is kind of, can you put a central line in and can you, um, do, do, you, do you push the right button, do you push the right lever on the ventilator, that's technical skills. Non-technical skills, everything else. Um, and Andy's here. Andy, are you on a, on a high time threshold, do you need to jump in. I only jumped in because no one is here and I started talking. All right, all right. Um, team steps training. Who's heard of team steps? Okay, well, uh, you've done it? Uh, okay, what do you think of it? Yeah, so team steps, so team steps, all it is, if CRM has all the tools in your garage, all the possible tools you can have for, for non-technical skills, team steps, what it did is, is it took a subset of those, you know, your, your go-to tool bag, and it, and it packaged them up and said, okay, here's your es essentials. So it's a kind of um, distilled version of CRM, which is, you know, uh, it's okay. Um, the history of team steps, it came, from, um, it came from the Air Force. So originally the concept was taken straight out of the Air Force manual for... Um, CRM, and they distilled it into um, a project called MedTeams, which was uh, led over here in Washington. Um, MedTeams was a military uh, healthcare kind of human factors training program, and it was incredibly successful. Uh, and what happened was, after 10 years of running MedTeams, the government, the federal government, said, this is so good, we need to translate that to civilian healthcare practice. And the problem with translating military healthcare uh, practice and protocols to civilian practice is it just doesn't work. And when they first tried it, you just, you just can't tell people to behave in a certain way and you can't tell people to speak in a certain way uh, like you can in the military. Uh, whereas in civilian practice, you say, I want you to say this and then I want you to say that. They'll go, they'll tell you exactly where to go with that. So that's the problem. Um, <laughs> There's, there's too many individuals and people don't respond to being ordered about very well. So, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm um, not going to do it. So this is part of my um, six hour talk, so we're just going to jump through this. So, uh, very positive history. What, what is it? Where, does it where, where, where did it come from? What is it? And a, a very short, you know, one minute segment of why I'm a CRM believer at Stroke Evangelist, okay? So, um, human factors came from NASA, so a very potted history of uh, space flight as um, people started building rockets and then uh, the rockets kept on blowing up and then the rockets stopped blowing up so they started sending small animals like dogs and chimpanzees into space when they stopped blowing up the dogs and chimpanzees and brought them black you know sent them to space orbited the earth a few times splashed down in the ocean picked them up and they were alive they started sending man to space uh, the early uh, space explorers had a mortality rate associated with that job and they still do um, and they, some, some of them died, but eventually they got their protocols down, they got the engineering down, and uh, it became fairly uh, safe to send man into space and then bring them back alive. So that's where they got to. And then um, something interesting happened. NASA, in their wisdom, said, hey, you know what, there's a cockpit, why don't we put two astronauts into the same cockpit? 
and lo and behold, their safety record just went whoop. Okay, so it just got drastically worse overnight. And uh, NASA, and when you hear them talk about this episode in their history, um, I had the privilege of going to speak to them in Florida a few years ago, and they said it was very distinct. As soon as they had dual astronaut manned spaceflight, their safety record plummeted. And they started studying it, and from there was born the science of human factors. So if you want to read about any of this stuff, a lot of it's public uh, material, and NASA's archives have got most of this. So they, start, they started it. And as an organization, they live it and they breathe it. Um, interestingly, why do you think uh, why, why do you think their safety record plummeted when they put two astronauts into a spaceship? They lost focus partially. Well, what do they refocus on then? If they lost focus on the mission or flying the spaceship, what do they refocus on? Interacting either in a positive or negative way with the Yeah. So okay, interacting negatively. So what kind of negative behaviours do you think we that we saw? Well, they saw. Doing things without expressly stating them. Yeah, so, uh, so the left hand doing, not knowing what the right hand's doing, so some of that happened. What else? But it's more attitudinal. You're, you're kind of very close, Kate. Yeah, so they probably both wanted to be the leader. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> there's competition. So if you think about the, uh, the, uh, the profile of a uh, 50s uh, test pilot, um, they are, you know, these are from the Air Force. They are fast jet um, uh, uh, aviators who got bored of flying fast jets, so they become test pilots, so they get to fly experimental very fast jets. And then if you, um, you know, get bored of that, then you volunteer to fly a spaceship. Okay, so that's your profile. And you put two of these guys, uh, but they're all guys back then, into uh, a very closed space with a load of liquid oxygen and strike a match. Suddenly there's a, there's a competition, and it was, it was competition about who, who could uh, do what. Um, and uh, miscommunication. So, um, CRM training is a system. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, this is the. Um, so, imagine, I want you to imagine CRM as a layer cake, and there's four layers to the cake. There's a layer called communication, that's the top layer. There's another layer called situation awareness, which basically is a posh way of saying knowing what's going on around you. There's another layer combined, I, I combine the next two problem solving, decision making, that's, that's the next one. And then teamwork is, is, the, uh, is what underpins it. And in half an hour, there's no way I can give you. Um, the, the full um, flavor of all the layers, but I'll give you one very thin slice through the whole cake and give you uh, just the key concepts for all those four layers, okay? Now, it's a system, and just like any system, you can teach it, and it's been taught around the world for other industries, such as aviation, such as nuclear power, such as, you know, any high-risk industry that involves technology and people um, uh, have uh, really embraced this, and aviation um, has really changed in the last 30 years. In the mid-70s, it wasn't very safe, in the late 70s to early 80s, they started training in CRM, and now the last 30 years, if you look at the safety record of aviation, it's just gone, it's just got better and better and better. And a large part is because they've learned how to work together as teams. And we are, in medicine, I think about 30 years behind where we need to be. Uh, and it's evidenced by the fact that none of you have had any human factors training, despite the fact you're all highly trained professionals. Um, but, and the assumption in medicine is, oh, well, the teamwork, oh, you'll just get that. That's the big flawed assumption. Okay, and it's massively flawed for lots of reasons. Um, why I believe this is so, so a couple of years ago, I had the privilege of flying with Great Western Air Ambulance as a trauma physician, and uh, we got deployed uh, in, in that's my house in England. Um, <laughs> and uh, that wasn't actually, we flew out to someone having an MI. Um, and that, that was our bag in the, in, the, in the helicopter. It was just me, uh, one doctor, one paramedic, and uh, one um, pilot who was uh, a great guy. And our airway equipment was really simple. A couple of scopes, some tubes, nothing fancy at all. Hand suction, uh, very rudimentary set of drugs, very basic drugs. And we went out to fly, to, we flew out to old grannies who crashed their car driving too fast in freezing fog. Young men who'd fallen down cement silos in a deep dark hole. Young guys who stole a car on the first day out of prison who've now got um, entrapped in a car. He's actually face down in the ditch there. Um, and his uh, femurs had popped out the back of his pelvis, so he's entrapped. He bullseyed the windscreen, so he's unconscious and needed a surgical airway in the car before they cut the, the roof off, but it takes 15 minutes to cut a roof off a car. So, um, and uh, the guy who taught me more about medicine than any doctor in the previous 14 years was the pilot at the back, so his name's Simon. He was our base captain. He was an ex-SAS uh, medevac pilot for 20 years, and he basically taught us uh, everything I'm gonna try and teach you in 
20 minutes. Um, he taught us how to look after each other, how to um, uh, taught us concepts of situational awareness, how you, how you know that you're losing it, how you know how, how techniques to regain it, uh, how to make good collective group decisions, uh, how not to compete against each other, um, and just uh, um, and just got us home safely uh, every time. And uh, so I credit the talk to Simon. So leadership, teamwork, situational awareness, problem solving. How about two minutes on each, okay? That's as much as I can give you, all right? If you want to come to my all day talk, I run it every, every month uh, in here, uh, in the sim, um, at undergraduate level. But any of you are welcome to come along to see me afterwards if you want to f hear the full thing. So leadership, um, I'm going to cut through that. This is, this is, if you want to cut to the core of leadership, all right? This, is, this slide is. So before you look at that slide, I'm just going to prime you, okay? Close your eyes, think of the best leader you have ever had. Okay, take 10 seconds. Best leader. And it could be in a sport, doesn't have to be in medicine. This is the best leader you've ever had in your life. You got him or her in your head? All right, open your eyes. Tell me, just volunteer out. Who, who, who was he or she? Why were, they so, why were they so good? Just throw it out there. What context was the leader in? It could be ultimate Frisbee leader. It could be anything. High school senior class advisor. High school senior class advisor. He or she? He. He. Tell me why he was so good. He was very charismatic. He was able to get everyone kind of involved. No matter what person. Got everyone involved despite all the personalities. So managed to get, gather people around them. Yes. All right. Good. Any other great leaders out there in your heads? I was thinking of my residency director. Residency really director. Good, um, <laughs> in his office and he would take the time to listen to you and not just direct things. Yep, okay. Yep, so we'll actually listen to people and does that extend into the clinical environment as well? Mm -hmm. So not only would they listen on a kind of mental level, but would they, in a, in a clinical situation, would, would, would gather, say, hey, ask information from all the team members, yeah? So, okay, that's a good sign of leader. Anything else? Any other great leaders out there? Come on, give me one more. I was in a music organization that had a leader that was able to motivate everybody to sort of want to excel without having to feed it into us or anything so like that. So how do they do that? Um, I think by sort of fostering a good sense of everybody working together, but in a very positive environment, in a very safe environment. Yeah, so make it safe, make it non-threatening. Um, was there a big hierarchy between the leader and the, the bottom of the food chain? So, so that's great. So if you can flatten the hierarchy, so the worst kind of leader, if you have a really steep hierarchy and people are afraid to speak to you. That's the, that's, the, that's the opposite of that. Okay, good. Um, the reason I put this slide up will become apparent in a second, but I want to do one more thought experiment, okay? Now, close your eyes again. Imagine the worst leader you've ever had the unfortunate to work with. Might take you back to a painful place. If you need some tissues, let me know. <laughs> all right, open your eyes. You've all got someone in mind? All right, come on, throw it out there. Why, why was the person in your mind the worst leader? What, what, what specific character, what made them so bad? What did they do that was so bad? Andy's smiling. Come on, Andy. Give it, give it to me. Well, they're all surgeons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, give it to us. Oh, well, just, um, well, just a series of, of surgeons that I've uh, interacted with that um, had uh, horrible, and the worst combination is, is a horrible personality with kind of marginal clinical competence. And those, those, those are, I mean, those, and, and there have been a few of those over the years, and those are just, just that's a deadly combination. And, you know, so sometimes you can muddle through if you have a horrible personality, and but you're at least a good yeah. clinician. Yeah. <laughs> I remember one, one time it was a vascular surgeon at, when I was a resident at an institution I won't name, and um, this guy, we were doing a fem pop of the big cortex graft in there, and I, I look at his sleeve, and there's this big hole in the sleeve with hairs, arm hairs ah, sticking out of it, yeah. and, and I was really conflicted as to whether to say anything. And did you? I did. And? <laughs> and, and, and he was, he just got really red, but he didn't, he didn't actually hit anyone, which is a lot of wood, and he stepped away from the table, and he said, I will make sure that this gown does not kill another patient, and, and he actually tore the gown in half off of his body, so that he Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, wow. All right. Uh, anyone else got uh, any stories approaching that level? 
come on, there must be some out there. Who's been shouted at by some horrible team leader? Who's, yeah, what happened? Oh, just I remember being a uh, medical student. Mm -hmm. Surgery resident. Um, and I remember being in the hospital and being like, wow, this is horrible. Okay, so overconfident who feels threatened. So how does that manifest? Yeah, assert the authority, stamp on people, make people scared of you. Yeah, perfect. All right. So, so I had the, I had the privilege of going to a place called Cranebrook a few years ago. Cranebrook is the largest training facility outside the USA for uh, pilots. And I spent a day with their captain trainer pilot and said, how do you assess non-technical skills in your pilots? Because every pilot has a check flight every four to six months, and they will get grounded if they exhibit disruptive behaviors. Okay? So I said, oh, it's easy. And I said, what do you mean it's easy? They had one sheet of paper, and I actually stole it from him, and I used it for a long time, and I took, made a digital copy recently. And he, has, and he had one sheet of paper, and one side he had leadership management. Down here, teamwork, you flipped it over. He had communication problem solving. Then you had uh, you know, decision making and, uh, and uh, com you know, communications. So the same domains as we're talking about. And all he did, he sat in the back of the cockpit, said nothing for six hours for the flight. And every time you had a behavior on this side, he would just mark down the time what you did that was on that, on that side. And then if these are negative, disruptive behaviors, and, uh, he would just, uh, and at the end of the flight, he said, OK, so uh, when, when your co-pilot did that, you didn't say thank you, and you didn't show any appreciation. And when you started the, the flight today, you had no enthusiasm and energy. You actually said, I'm really bored. You didn't want to be here. Um, you were difficult to contact. When he spoke to you, you didn't speak back. Um, well, you didn't brief properly, you didn't establish any bottom lines. When other people suggested things, you just ignored them and blanked them. Um, you didn't give any feedback when required, and you didn't follow the standard operating procedure, standard procedure, standard work. You broke all the protocols, you didn't wait for clearance before, you know, wh whatever it might be. Um, you, not only did you not follow the standard procedure, when someone else broke the standard procedure, you didn't call them on it. And so you're not monitoring your crew, so you're not, you're not set adhering to a high standard. Uh, and, you did, and when you saw them, not only about to break the rule, you didn't actually intervene when they were breaking it. You didn't, so you just kind of let it go. So that the message you give is it's okay to break the rules. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, you would deviate from a standard course um, without telling anybody. You just kind of just do it. And uh, because, and, okay, so these are all, these are all negative behaviors. And you can apply those straight to medicine, okay? My, my story for it is we, I was working in a place that I'm not going to name with a very famous professor of inten pediatric intensive care who was putting in a central line in a 15-year-old kid. And um, the, uh, the uh, first-year um, resident who was, or second-year resident, pediatric resident who was doing a, some time in PICU said, OK, we're going to do a central line. So she brings up the uh, central line carts towing the ultrasound machine behind. And he looks at her and says, what is that? And she goes, it's a Sonosite, you know, S2000. Yeah. He goes, why on earth did you bring that? And she goes, well, well sir, um, it says on, on the laminated standard protocol, it says, number one, bring uh, ultrasound to bedside and cut. He goes, I don't need that. I know where the heart is. And I'm, 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 I'm just out of earshot rolling my eyes at this point. Going, oh. I go, he goes, really? So if you know where the heart is, you can, can you? He goes, yeah, let me show you. So anyway, he gets this eight centimeter line, went boom, and uh, this uh, needle, and he misses, okay? And then I think, oh, okay. And then he goes again, misses. And the third time, he, you know, he, and he's hugging this thing in a 15-year-old. And he gets it and aspirates blood, blah, 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 it's all good, and uh, puts his line in, very slickly does his knots without looking, and she, she's like in awe of this guy, you know? And, um, and he's like lapping it up, thinking, yeah, okay, this is good. And, uh, and then she starts to write out a chest x-ray request card. And in England, we don't have computerized ordering. So you have to write a little postcard and deliver it with your, the, you know, find the, your favorite radiologist, uh, radiographer with a candy bar and give it to her. And, and then she'll, she'll do it at her convenience usually. I mean, say they're usually girls. Um, and uh, that's how it works. And uh, so he, she's filling out the request card. He goes, what? what are you doing? And she goes, oh, step six of the protocol says to order chest x-ray. He goes, well, why do you want to do that? Uh, because I'm trying to make you a thinking doctor. Why do you want to order it? Well, I want to make sure the line's in the right place. I want to make sure it's in a vein and it's not in the heart. And I want to make sure there's no pneumothorax, sir. And he goes, well, of course it's in the right place. Look, it's a 12 centimeter, you know, it's 15 centimeter line. I'm 12 here. Look at the size of the guy. I've got a perfect CVP waveform. There's dark blood coming out of all three lumens. Where the hell could it be? So you don't need that. And a pneumothorax. He goes, well, I haven't caused a pneumothorax. Ripped up the card. 
Okay? So, um, eight hours later, it's now one in the morning, and uh, she's on call. He's gone home 20 miles away. A kid develops an oxygen requirement of 10 liters and desaturating. She orders a test x ray of the 50% pneumothorax on that side. So she calls him up and uh, says, Oh, there's a 50% pneumothorax on the right side of the guy you just put a central line eight hours ago. So, and he goes, Oh, shit. And he's really grumpy. Puts the phone. Uh, he says, Well, put a chest drain in. Puts the phone down. And she's a second year resident, has never put a chest drain in an adult before. And this is a 70 kilo kid. So she rings him back and said, I'm a pediatrician, I've done them in neonates, I've never done this before. And uh, he was difficult to contact, not very visible, lacked enthusiasm and didn't, sh you know, and failed to coach and said, you must be able to do this. You're a second year resident. This is, should be in your competency set. Put the phone down on her. So she proceeds, okay? Now she doesn't know that asleep 50 yards away is a surgical registrar or fellow who's in bed doing nothing. There's also an anesthesia fellow asleep in bed doing nothing, both of whom could have helped. But she's in her silo, and so she proceeds. And she doesn't, she's, no one's ever taught her the triangle of safety, so she goes, oh, yes. Yeah, well, that'll do, okay? She's two rib spaces below the triangle of safety, puts in a needle, puts in a tube, and of course it's a fenestrated tube, and she gets some air back. Two days later, pus starts to come out of the chest drain. And uh, what's happened is so she's gone through the pleural space and the tip has actually gone through the diaphragm and gone through the liver capsules embedded in the liver. Just the, you know, half a centimeter. And, uh, and uh, the kid actually died from sepsis. Now that's never a death that's reported. It's kind of no, it's complication. Uh, and she almost left medicine. And, and, and it was this, I said, but you didn't kill this patient. Who killed? Someone didn't comply with the S standard procedure, broke at least three rules, didn't give you any support when you needed it to, didn't tell you who to call. And, you know, so, so these leadership, these are disruptive behaviors that kill people. Now, we don't recognize that in medicine yet. If you're a pilot and exhibit those behaviors, you'd be grounded, okay? And when we're, the hospital management hasn't quite got the balls to fire people for, because they, these tend to be senior people. So we haven't really quite got there yet. There's a great book written by John Nance, and it says why hospitals should fly. It describes a fictional hospital and uh, who's, who kind of embraced these terms and just sacked, uh, and they're, they're not huge. So like Andy said there's, there's, there's a handful out there, uh, but they, they, they make a big noise. Um, but if you, uh, yeah, we haven't quite got to the stage where we'll sack you or ground you if you, if you exhibit too many of those behaviors. Anyway, so the reason for showing this is it compares and contrasts old style leadership style, which is old style. So what did James T. Kirk, who's, who are the Trekkies amongst you guys? Come on, there must be. Come on, admit it. Yes, okay. Leadership style, James Kirk, what did he do? Yeah, flies to a planet, bad aliens, what does he do? Yeah, he rips off his shirt, you know, <laughs> just fire, you know, pulls off some crazy maneuver, kills the alien, saves the world, yeah? And no one questions him because he's the captain, yeah? Jean-Luc Picard, okay? Imagine this, uh, Romulan border, you know? Romulans are coming They're on, in, in the corner of the neutral zone, about to face off against the humans, all right? What does he do? Yeah, he talks them down, he calls the staff meeting, he goes, all right, I want my tactical officer in here, I want my weapons guy in here, give me some options, guys. Okay, this describes the situation, give me some options. So, you know, he actively seeks engagement from his team, okay? Does it, is, is he weak and does he not know his stuff? No, uh, but he, he knows that he'll make a better decision from sharing information, not keeping it inside his head, and working and using the resources around him. So there, compare and contrast. New style, old style, okay? This is where we should move to. Um, that was more than two minutes. All right, teamwork communication. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and keep this under two minutes. Um, any Formula One sports fans here? No, motorsports. So this is a Formula One car coming in from 200 miles an hour down to 60, decelerating to zero, and then swapping all four tires, resetting the wings, refueling in 7.3 seconds, and then relaunching, okay? Who thinks our medical teams works with this degree of precision, coordination, and efficiency? No, okay, why not? Let's take our code team. Why do our code teams not work with this amount of precision? Lack of clarity about jobs. Yeah. Like not everybody in the room knows what everybody's doing. Okay. All right. So you guys are on the code team. Okay. Um, so when you're on the code team and it's 10 o'clock and they call a code, have you met the people on the team that morning? No. No. So you don't know who they are. All right. Do you think these guys meet together and train together regularly? Okay. So you're not really a team. Okay. 
it's like, you know, my son's basketball team is more of a team than you guys are a team because they actually train together three times a week and he's nine, okay? So, yeah, the same set of people. They have a coach. They train together. They work out what went wrong last time. They debrief. They brief. These are a bunch of nine-year-olds playing basketball, okay? They, they work as a team. Our code team, traditional code teams, is a bunch of people carrying a random pager for a day who've got no idea who the person standing next to them is until they meet over a dead body, okay? That's the floor number one, okay? Um, when Seattle Children's are, so I've done a load of stuff with the medical students and I've got them outperforming our professional code teams in there. And they say, how do you do it? And I said, well, they just needed four hours of training. And they said, can you do that at the main hospital? I said, if you give me a standard code team, give me the same team for a week, we can do this, okay? Because all you do is you meet together for 20 minutes in the morning, you run a sim, you debrief it, you make sure everyone knows who they are, and then, and then they're good to go. And I said, but it needs to be the same team for a week, you know, same day team. Same, and they said, no, that's going to require a rewrite of all the rotors. So that would be impossible. End of story. End of discussion. I said, okay, if you can't give me a stable team, we can't do it. But you need a stable team. So, uh, um, so um, they have, um, the, the point of showing this up is not only, so that's a teamwork bit. That's what I'm talking about. So have a stable team. Um, so we're a million miles away from that. The other thing is uh, having a standardized communication package. So the most important uh, job in this 21-man team is uh, this guy, he's the anesthesiologist. I mean, sorry, he's the, <laughs> he's the lollipop man. Okay? He says go or don't go, all right? So he has a lollipop that says stop. He flips it over, has a number one, says first gear, and then he goes zoop. And then the driver, as soon as he sees it, he goes zoop, just floors it, okay? The driver is not looking around going, he's not sitting there going, huh, is that wheel on? Is that, he's got total trust in the, in the guy that says go, all right? So the question is, how do the wheel crews and the fuel guy communicate to the uh, lollipop man that things are good to go? That's the question. So how do you, what's their modality of communication? A hand signal, okay. Do you think they meet at seven in the morning, since I told you they meet together? Do you think that the front, so this is it's a three-man crew, gunman, spare gun, wheel off, wheel on, okay? So do you think they meet together and go, hey, so, yeah, so you're the front wheel guy. How would you like to tell me I'm the lollipop man? How, how do you feel like telling me that the wheel's on today? <laughs> yeah, so let's take all the individual autonomy and the kind of freestyling and ad-libbing out of it and just say, hey, let's do it the way we always do it. And the way they always do it is they put their hand in the air, okay? So in any communication, there's a receiver and there's a giver of the, of the message. If you can standardize how the message comes across, the receiver, I'm already primed for it. I'm looking for a hand signal because I'm always expecting a hand signal. So the, the chance of making an error is much smaller. But to do, and it's such a simple concept, that you have to standardize the way and the style it comes out in, and, and then everyone is expect, there's an expectation, okay? Um, if you don't do that, people are lost. Because if you give you an AOK -OK on Monday, and then it depends who it is, if it's Dan on Tuesday, and it just gives you, you know, or, you know, whatever it, whatever it might be. It's like, well, what does that mean? Okay? So the, there's three causes of any error. One is misperception. Two is miscommunication. Three is uh, assumption. Okay? And if you don't standardize it, you're going to get at least one of those things. You're going to get a miscommunication or an assumption or a misperception. Something's going to creep in there that's going to mess you up. So the more you standardize it and you take out the uh, free ad-libbing, the easier it becomes, the more effective. Does that make sense? It's a lollipop guy from just kind of anticipating and being ready to pop it up and, and then popping it up and, <laughs> and the last arm isn't really tough. Yeah, so watch very carefully again. I want to rewind it. Okay. Watch for the arm signal. See that? Boom. These guys are still working. These guys are still working. These guys are done. So watch the back two wheels. Boom. That, he's done. He's done. Now, the only thing that's not done is the fuel. That fuel pumping uh, 12 liters per second. That's for, what, that's three gallons a second, okay? The engine is uh, here, all right? So if the manifold's not locked on, they're pumping, you get this massive fireball, and that's happened, okay? So let's talk about bottom lines, and let's talk about contingency planning. What are the contingency plans to stop this guy burning alive, okay? Plan A, there's a splash guard, okay? This is the rear splash guard. It's a, basically a plastic sheet, which gets, and the odd splash going through as you pull away or lock on is not going to set fire, okay? That's a, it's a kind of weak defense, but it's kind of there. Plan two is a guy with a pin pulled out. He's the rear fire guard, and he's, he's got the extinguisher ready to go, okay? Um, 
plan to see is a guy in the car who's actually lying down in the car, so he can't get up very fast, okay? He's wearing Nomex underwear, Nomex fire retardant underwear, okay? Which is why, and it's, and it's, it's got gloves as well, and there's no sp exposed bits of skin. So it gets you very hot when you're pulling G around the racetrack, but it stops you burning alive in that contingency, okay? And we used to wear Nomex on our flight suits as well. So, and then, so that's plan C. Plan D is that out of shot is two people ready to run in and pull this guy out, okay? So, and they, and do you think they plan for fires? Yes. And they rehearse how to do it? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to say that. And, and we, we don't plan for any of the things that, you know, when, when, when do we drill for our Ruinga spasm in Paki? When do we drill for our tonsillar bleed? When do we drill for the things that happen with a certain degree of frequency? We, we don't. Um, so the signal for the uh, fuel guy is that they step away and show him the fuel line, okay? And here we go. Fuel line go, lollipop goes, car goes. All right, that's it. That's all I'm going to say about teamwork communication. Um, uh -oh. This is my favorite slide. I'm going to show you this. So those of you in the OR have realized that our WHO and our sign-in and our sign-out checklist are all now reformatted into the challenge response system. Um, that was inspired by, um, um, well, actually, it's a standard system used in our, our pre-flight checklist. But I'll show this video to the whole of operative services before we went live with it. and said, look, if a seven-year-old can issue a 13 challenge item challenge and response checklist in 27 seconds in crappy handwriting and he can't read one of the words, okay, uh, uh, and he's doing this once a week, a trained professional team can issue an 18 response, which is how many line items we have in our, in our surgical timeout, they must be able to do it in under 20 seconds, okay? And it's printed rather than written in bad handwriting. And uh, so, and yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good example of a challenge response um, checklist. Now, uh, one thing about the checklist, since we're talking about it, is what about those funny things that are on there that are so rare, okay? And uh, one of the funny things on, our, this is our pre-flight checklist for Helimed uh, 6.5, which is our call sign, was a float arm switch. And uh, one of the things, uh, so I'm not an aviator, and uh, after, <laughs> after a few months, I, I said to Simon, I said, hey, so I, I need to understand, so when I read out the challenges, and you're just kind of reading out random numbers to me, I don't really know what you're saying, and, uh, but you know, it, looks, it sounds good. And he goes, yeah, he says, you, you're my cognitive aid. I said, that's fine. Um, but can you explain so I, I understand more of your job? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. So he goes, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, let's talk about float arm switches. Okay. And he goes, I said, what the hell's a float arm switch? Because, uh, oh, he goes, that's really easy to explain. And he drew a diagram of a helicopter. So the skids is what you land on. And some helicopters have these thing called floats. And you can blow them up. And then you get the CO2 canister and it explodes. And you get these floats and you land on water. I said, that's great. That sounds really cool. And when are we going to do that? He goes, oh, we don't, we're not going to do that. Because uh, why not? Oh, we don't have any floats on our, um, on our helicopter. Uh, OK. But I uh, said, so what's the float arm? Oh, the arm, float arm switch is this switch, which is usually by my right knee. And if I hit it by accident, so I jerk my knee, uh, the, you deploy the floats. And uh, if, you're, if you're flying at 150 miles an hour at 500 feet, you destabilize, and you could actually crash, and you could all die. You know, if you, you know. And I said, ah. So the float arm switch is just a plastic cover that goes over the, because you often test it in the morning, you know, if you do something with it to make sure you've got electrical contact. Uh, but, you know, you, you just put, make sure the cap is over so you don't do that by accident. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, hang on, you just told me we don't have one, so why don't we just cross it off the checklist? We don't need that. And he goes, and he goes you missed the point. If you, unless you perform the checklist in its entirety, the same way, every time, one day you're going to have um, a helicopter that they're going to, which does have floats, and you're not going to do it, and you're going to miss it, and that's the day you'll die. And sure enough, a couple of months later, Alex, Simon's on the holiday, Alex is his uh, replacement pilot, he's from the same regiment, 
and uh, we have a Eurocopter that does have floats. And we got to, you know, we were taking off, and this is the lady who's T-boned uh, on a motorbike and with a fractured pelvis. We flew out to her and picked her up, and I was reading the pre-flight checklist. I go, float arm switch. She goes, locked. And it's the, it the first time in six months it ever, it was ever a positive response. They are. Great. And I don't know if it saved my life that day, but um, I'm glad it was locked rather than unlocked. You know, and, uh, there you go. So there's a few things on our surgical tests which are for outliers, but you know, if it's not applicable, just move on. But um, uh, the classic one is DVT. It's like how many people need DVT prophylaxis for an ear tube or, you know. But you know, in Bellevue, we haven't had a single positive response to uh, DVT as a challenge. And then yesterday, we had a girl with some crazy vasculitis and an anoxyparum just having an IED placement, okay? And she's pro-coagulopathic, I can't say that word at the moment. Um, and she is the one patient of that year who needed DVT prophylaxis, okay? And it's DVT prophylaxis on, you know? And so, you, so your number needed to treat, if you want to think about it, is 2,500 to save that one, okay? Uh, but that's no different from any other medicine where you treat 400 people with a beta blocker to prevent one MRI, or you treat how many people with aspirin to prevent one stroke. So it's, a, so it's the same concept. You need to do it a number of times, and most of the time it can't make no difference, but the one time you do need it, it's there. Okay? That's all I'm going to say about checklists. Um, situational awareness. This is an awareness test. <laughs> The answer is 13. But do you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> Who, Mr. Bear? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, first time, or who saw the first time, all right. So situation awareness is uh, knowing what's going on around you. So the problem with situation awareness is uh, we are really, really prone to getting uh, a couple of things. Uh, target fixation, so you get really funneled in on a task and you lose concept of time, you lose concept of what's going on around you, okay? So that's the first. Um, and it's, the, the, the first defense is knowing it happens to everybody, even the best of us, okay? Um, the second thing is, uh, I love this slide, okay, it got sent to me on Facebook last night, but I incorporated it, is when things go, start to go wrong, okay, our human instinct is to say, um, is to think, interpret the facts around us and the inputs around us in the best possible light. And a good example of that is when your pulse oximeter line goes flat, what's the first thing you think of? It's not working, all right, so yeah, it must be a faulty pulse. So what's your first play? What's the first thing you do? You have a look at it and you wrap it around another finger or whatever, okay? Okay, if, that, if it's not working then, what do you do? So you think, okay, you wrapped it around the other finger, the hand's a little bit cold. What, 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 how do you interpret a flat pulse oximeter trace now? This has happened to you guys, yeah? All right, so how, what do you do? What do you do? Blue. You look at them, yeah, okay, they're, they're not really blue, they're still pink, but the flat pulse of symptoms are still pretty flat, so what do you do? Do they have pulses? Ah, do you have a pulse? All right, so there you go, That's, uh, so you're clearly well trained, okay? Now, saying that in a classroom is different from doing it in practice, all right? Um, because, so, uh, and I'll tell you a story at the end of what, when you make those assumptions. So everyone assumes when you see a flat line, it, the patient's okay, but it must be a pulse oximeter. And that can have devastating consequences. But you have to realize that we have a natural inclination to do that. So whenever I see a, false, a flat pulse oximeter, I think, I think they're in cardiac arrest until I, someone tells me that they've got a pulse. So the first thing, check a pulse, check a cap, do something, okay? Yeah. All right, um, I'm coming to the end of my time. Anyone who wants to hear the full talk, Come to come to one of my weekly, uh, monthly sessions. Okay, there's there's a bit more on problem solving. Uh, there's a bit of uh, I'm going to end here. Do no harm. It's all about do no harm. 
CRM. This is the error chain, 1960s model of medical error. It's a chain. If you break one chain, the error doesn't go through. 1980s model is uh, you have the Swiss cheese model, which is basically you have a technology boundary, a proficiency boundary, and a standard procedure. And if all the cheeses line up, then the error gets through. The 1990s or early 2000s model is dynamic error modeling. So the error comes through from screen left to screen right, okay? represented by a ball. If the ball reaches the end of the screen, harm is done to the patient. And any hospital or healthcare facility has technology proficiency, SOPs, and judgment. And what we're really talking about is judgment and human factors, and whether you can combine your team's brain power, which is significant, to create good team judgment. Um, so that error got through, harm's done. This is a sicker patient represented by a steeper gradient. Okay? So the error is going to come through a lot faster. You still have the same boundaries, but you've had some team training. You've got flattened hierarchies. People are allowed to talk to each other. No one's going to shout at you if you say, I'm worried about this doctor or I'm worried about this nurse. You know, no one's going to think you're stupid. Um, and you're, and it, people are allowed to speak up and uh, you have good judgment, you trap the error. Okay? The best example of that was last week in Bellevue. We had a first year a medical, not first year medical student, a medical student on her first day of working out there with me. Her name was Mary. She was visiting from Idaho. We had a seven o'clock brief with uh, uh, our surgeon, uh, with everyone, 20 people around there. And uh, Greg, uh, one of our orthopedic surgeons, introduced himself to her and said, hi, Mary, shook her hand. I, where are you from? Yeah, that, that was it, you know, just a 10 second int interaction. And she came up and said, that was nice. You know, everyone, I was introduced to the team. That was nice, you know, before we started work. And then uh, we, we just done our time out. We're about to uh, go knife to skin. And, uh, and I'm just about to fill out my chart. And um, Mary says, hey, excuse me, Greg. I'm thinking, oh, one. All right, let's go. Let's see where this goes. And Greg turns around and says, Yes, Mary. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but they, were, they had a first name interaction to her. He goes, "Is that like handle sterile?" And uh, and he goes, uh, "Nope." He goes, "Well, I think your drape just touched it before as, as it went down." He's doing a four-hour ACL. And he goes, "Really?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Thank you very much, Mary." And said, "Can I have an extra drape?" And draped over it. And I thought I spoke to her after. I thought that's that's great. I said, "Okay, you've been at the U for four weeks. What's the chance of you calling a attending surgeon just before he goes knife to skin?" Um, by his first name and asking him to stop. Goes, Zero. What's the chance of you telling him um, in front of everyone else that he's made a mistake? Zero. Okay. What made it okay to speak up today? And she goes, well, you know, uh, we've been interchanging emails. You know, uh, we, I met you at ISIS a few times. Uh, you, you, you said to me that uh, you know, we went to the CRM thing. And I said speaking up is a good thing. You know, there's a potential for patient harm. I saw him touch the light handle. I knew. Uh, I, I didn't know it's not sterile, but I, you know, um, but I asked the question and. Uh, and, uh, and he, he, he did say hi to me earlier. He seemed a really friendly guy. I didn't think he was going to shout me or eat me or throw a knife at me. And I thought it was the right thing to do. And I thought, that's the key. OK, that's the key. Now, I don't know if that would have been an infected ACL, but it might have been. You know? So um, that's what we're aiming for. Anyway, I'm going to end it there, because I've gone way over time. I'm sorry. Um, and, so there's, uh, and we're going to do some more of this stuff uh, later on this afternoon. So at least I've kind of broad brush stroke touched on most of the topics. Okay. Um, is that okay? Questions? We can talk during lunch as well. All right, who's up next? Who's getting up next? All right. Bozy, do you need a thumb drive or a...